Hello, my name is Dr. Jerry Ryan, PhD. I'm here today to give a presentation on autonomic dysreflexia. It's a training session for emergency room staff and EMTs. And autonomic dysreflexia is basically a life-threatening condition for people with spinal cord injuries. The way I'll cover this today will be we will talk about the, uh, what causes autonomic dysreflexia, what it is, what the signs and symptoms are, and what the treatment is, and we'll have a review at the end. This presentation is supported by grant number 545 from the Paralyzed Veterans of America Education Foundation, and it's produced by myself, Dr. Jerry Ryan, from the Oregon chapter of the Paralyzed Veterans of America. The presentation is designed to be an introductory overview and it's derived from the following publications that are produced by the Consortium for Spinal Cord Injury Medicine and that is funded through the Paralyzed Veterans of America. The two documents that this presentation is taken from, the first one is a clinical practice guidelines for professional medical staff. It's called the Acute Management of Autonomic Dysreflexia, Individuals with Spinal Cord Injury Presenting to Healthcare Facilities. The second document is a consumer guide and it's called Autonomic Dysreflexia, What You Should Know. The presentation is intended merely to raise awareness about the symptoms and the treatment of autonomic dysreflexia in persons with spinal cord injury and is to be used in conjunction with the above cited publications. Viewing this presentation does not substitute for reading the guidelines in their entirety. I have a special note for the EMTs. The information that I'm going to give in this presentation is not to be considered as an authorization to disregard your state laws regarding the limitations of EMT medical care. We will cover some uh, treatment procedures that probably won't be um, legal in some states for EMTs. So what you should do as an EMT is to make sure that you check your state laws on what's going on and Basically, for the EMTs, this is to let the ER staff know about the autonomic dysreflexia of a patient. All right, so what is autonomic dysreflexia, or AD? Uh, throughout this, I'll say autonomic dysreflexia. I may just say dysreflexia. I may just say AD. They're all interchangeable. It's also called hyperreflexia. Autonomic dysreflexia is basically an abnormal response in a person with a spinal cord injury to some stimulus in a part of the body that's below the injury. It is an emergency condition, and it's life-threatening for the individual, so it does require immediate attention. So for the basis of what autonomic dysreflexia is, the body controls the blood pressure and the body temperature through a series of capillaries and uh, comes through the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is both within and outside of your spinal cord, and it runs parallel with your regular central nervous system. And all these nerves interconnect and they're all controlled by the brain and the spinal cord. So what happens in a, in a episode of autonomic dysreflexia is the spinal cord injury basically jeopardizes the person's ability to control their, their body temperature as well as their blood pressure. And blood pressure is the key issue here. And what happens are the nerve impulses are blocked at the site of the injury. And so the result basically is the nervous system gets a mixed response, or a confused response, and it doesn't have a clear picture of what the stimulus is. So what happens is the autonomic nervous system kicks in and basically sends a person's blood pressure through the roof and some other uh, things like that we'll cover in a moment. Now who is at risk? Primarily it's quadriplegic and tetraplegic, which is another interchangeable term. Patients, so injuries above thoracic level 6, T6 or above, are the most common people for autonomic dysreflexia, although there have been cases as far as T10, as far down the spine as T10, where people can have signs and symptoms of autonomic dysreflexia. So this information will still be helpful for folks with injuries below T6. All right, the common warning signs, these are some... Uh, Graphic slides to give you a kind of a depiction of what the signs are. Now the worst and most uh, important sign to take care of is the fast, rapid increase in blood pressure. Um, 
the biggest problem here is uh, the increase in the blood pressure, compounding headaches, those type of things. And when I say a major increase in blood pressure, what we mean is 25 to 40 points systolic above normal. Normal for a quadriplegic will not be the typical 120 over 80. Um, for example, I'm a quadriplegic. My, my baseline blood pressure is 90 over 60. So if I come in presenting at 120 over 80, you should be suspecting a problem. Pounding headache is another sign of autonomic dysreflexia. Goes along with the increase in blood pressure. Sweating, heavy sweating, particularly in the area of the face, neck, shoulders. Uh, once again, it's usually, but not always, above the point of the spinal cord injury. The same type of thing happens with the skin. It can change color. You can have little blotches, thumbnail-sized blotches of red, or the entire um, skin can have a flush complexion. And again, this is usually above the site of the injury. Goosebumps, another sign on the skin. Uh, again, usually above the, sign of the, uh, the site of the injury. Feeling of tightness in the chest, your constriction, uh, like you've got a belt around your chest, those types of things, trouble breathing. Blurry vision or seeing spots, uh, primarily related once again to the blood pressure increase. Anxiety or jitters, this can also turn into confusion and agitation. And a stuffy nose is another one of the, the signs. So the symptoms in review. The elevated blood pressure, again, this is the most critical aspect of an autonomic dysreflexia episode. And if you'll note there, it's with a normal or low pulse. In speaking with many physicians about this, this is the only time you're ever going to see an elevated blood pressure with a normal or low pulse. And again, it's 20 to 40 points above the baseline for that individual. You will probably need to question the individual about what is their baseline. A severe and pounding headaches, once again, accompanied by the blood pressure, the sweating above the level of the injury, the nasal congestion, the skin changes. Again, that includes the goose bumps, the uh, flushing of the skin, or the little blotches. Agitation, confusion, anxiety, jitters, those types of things. Now, what are the causes of autonomic dysreflexia? Well, as I've stated before, dysreflexia is usually caused by some form of an irritation below the level of the injury. The most common cause is a bladder problem, either bladder distension or other urinary complications. The studies show that this is about 85 to 90 percent of the time the problem, so this should always be the first place you look for um, to alleviate the situation for the patient. Check the urinary system. And note in red at the bottom of the slide, IV fluids are not advised prior to ruling this out. This person is going through an episode of dysreflexia for bladder distension. The last thing you're going to want to do is plug an IV into them and give them more fluids. The issue is to drain the fluids that they have at that point. All right, so let's continue with the urinary system. I'll go through a couple of different systems to, uh, to check out for causes of autonomic dysreflexia. As I've stated, bladder distension is the A number one um, cause of this problem. Uh, that includes block catheters and that type of thing. Bladder or kidney stones can also do this, as can doing cystoscopies or any type of urologic procedures. In the GI system, uh, this is the second area. If the person's bladder is draining fine, the second problem to look for is impacted bowel. That constitutes probably the remaining 10 to 10 or so percent. If it's not bladder, move to the bowels. So the other problems within the GI system that can cause autonomic dysreflexia, besides bowel distension and impaction, would include gallstones, gastric ulcers, appendicitis, any type of a GI exam can do it, and uh, hemorrhoids can also cause an episode. Integumentary system, the skin. Um, constrictive clothing, belts, if the shoes are too tight, uh, the sock could be bunched up inside of the shoe, uh, the leg bag, the urinary leg bag straps could be too tight, anything like that. 
Over time can cause an episode of dysreflexia, contact with a hard or a sharp object in an area where the person doesn't feel it. Uh, burns, people have gotten this from having their feet too close to a heater in the wintertime, those type things. Sunburns, infected toenails, ingrown toenails, insect bites, all of these things. And pressure sores, if a person has a pressure sore and they're trying to get up and sit on it, their body's going to let them know that that's not what they need to do and it'll cause a, a uh, episode of dysreflexia. The reproductive system. The actual act of intercourse and ejaculation can set off an episode of dysreflexia, uh, as can STDs, epididymitis for men, and scrotal compression. Uh, sitting on the scrotum or even having the pants bunched up by the scrotum can set that off. And for women, the menstrual cycle and vaginitis can cause uh, episodes of dysreflexia. All right, those were the three main areas. You start with the urinary bladder, you, then you move on to the bowel, and then the skin. Uh, and here are some other systemic causes that are maybe five, one to five percent of the time this will be the problem. If you've ruled out the other three, you start looking for DVTs, uh, deep vein thrombosis, excessive alcohol or caffeine or any other type of diuretic consumption of that. Uh, fractures, bone fractures will definitely set off an episode of dysreflexia. Pulmonary emboli and heterotopic bone. Heterotopic bone is basically a calcium deposit in a joint area uh, on somebody who hasn't moved that area for quite some time. Some other systemic causes would include boosting. This is something that is done by SCI athletes. I'm not terribly familiar with it, but it is documented in the literature. Uh, functional electrical stimulation. That's where they would put the electrical pads on an individual's legs and stimulate them to uh, facilitate them pedaling a bicycle, for example. This type of stimulation can cause an episode of dysreflexia. Substance abuse of any type, beyond alcohol, over-the-counter drugs, prescribed stimulants, any type of substance abuse can set this off. And of course, invasive procedures uh, and surgical procedures would definitely set it off. And for women, childbirth is another area that uh, of concern for autonomic dysreflexia. Obviously, it's going to happen during the labor and delivery portion of the pregnancy. It may happen at other times, but labor and delivery is the most common. And uh, everybody involved, the entire OBGYN team, needs to be aware of that and take the precautions prior to the labor and delivery. Now, if you think your patient has autonomic dysreflexia, again, I need to make a reminder for the EMTs that you need to check your state laws to make sure that you can do some of these procedures that I'm about to cover within your state law. Some of the following procedures can only be performed by authorized medical personnel and will not be legal in some states for EMTs, so you need to check your state laws. All right, the very first thing to do if you suspect the individual has autonomic dysreflexia is begin checking their blood pressure. You're going to want to do that every three to five minutes until you resolve the problem. Um, if the person has the signs and symptoms but doesn't have a high blood pressure yet, then you need to get that individual to the uh, consultant that, that is appropriate for their symptoms. Now, if the blood pressure is already elevated, the most important thing to do is set that individual up. Uh, once again, this is somewhat counterintuitive. People want to lay everybody down on the stretcher and put an IV in them. In the case of autonomic dysreflexia, these are the two worst things you could do. You want to keep that person sitting up until their blood pressure is normal. Um, so they can either be sitting up or with their legs dangling is preferred and just sitting upright. The next thing to do is loosen any type of constrictive clothing, um, obvious things like shoes, socks, um, and again, checking the urinary, uh, urinary collection system, see if the leg straps are too tight, anything like that. And again, while you're doing this, you're continuing to monitor the person's blood pressure and pulse every three to five minutes. Now you begin to look over the patient to see what's causing the problem. Uh, you've already loosened the clothing. So once again, we're going to go to the urinary system because, again, 85 to 95 percent of the time, this is where the problem lies. If the person does not have an indwelling catheter, catheterize the patient at that point. 
You'll see the note there that says for the EMTs to check the laws in their state regarding catheterization. Now, prior to putting in a catheter in this individual, use some 2% lidocaine jelly and give it a couple of minutes to numb the area. You have to realize this person is already going through an episode of AD and it's caused by some type of noxious stimulant and you are about to catheterize a person, which is a fairly traumatic uh, experience. So you want to uh, have the area as numb as possible. If the person already has an indwelling catheter, check the entire system from top to bottom for any type of kinks, any type of blockage, or anything that could be obstructing the flow. If you can find the problem there, correct it immediately. Now, if the catheter appears to be blocked, you can flush the catheter. Now, you want to use uh, body temperature normal saline for this uh, because, once again, uh, the person's going through a stimulation that's noxious, and if you start instilling cold water, or cold saline, rather, and uh, or saline is too warm, you're going to add another traumatic event to this pro to the process. So use about 10 to 15 cc's, that's plenty of saline to irrigate the catheter and get flow. And again, don't be tapping on the bladder or any type of those techniques to try to get the bladder to function because you will cause stimulus and spike the person's blood pressure. Now if the catheter is draining and the blood pressure remains elevated, you'll proceed to recommendation 16, which we'll cover in a moment. If the catheter is not draining, and the blood pressure remains elevated, then you need to remove the catheter and replace it. There must be some type of internal clog to the system. There could be blood clots. There could be any number of uh, things that are occluding the catheter at that point. And once again, prior to replacing this catheter, be sure to use that lidocaine jelly because this is again gonna be a fairly noxious stimulant to the person and you want to uh, want to alleviate that as much as you can. So use the lidocaine jelly and give them about two minutes on that. If you have any difficulty in replacing a catheter, and this oftentimes happens because the person will, uh, the body will just be going through so many things that the bladder sphincters aren't going to cooperate like they normally do. So you may have to consult a urologist, you may have to try passing a Coudet catheter. Um, it's just something to bear in mind. Now, all the while you're doing this, be sure you're also maintaining uh, a monitoring of a person's blood pressure and pulse. Okay, now, if you've done all this and the person still is exhibiting the signs and symptoms and has a high blood pressure, you should suspect fecal impaction. That's the number two reason for an episode of AD. At this point also, if the blood pressure is over 150 systolic, you might want to consider doing some pharmacologic management um, which would be a short duration type thing uh, with some antihypertensive agents. Uh, primarily, it would be nitropase, something that has a rapid onset, but a short duration. Um, once again, for these type of uh, procedures I'm about to explain, the EMTs need to check their local state laws because some of this won't be allowed uh, for EMTs depending on state to state. Now, also, if the person's blood pressure is not above 150 systolic, then you can move right on to number 20. We'll get to that in a second. Now, if you're going to use an antihypertensive agent with this individual, once again, nitropaste would be the selection of choice. Uh, has a rapid onset, short duration. It quits the delivery as soon as the nitropaste tape is removed. Once you, if you were determined to give a person some type of pharmacologic management for their blood pressure, you need to uh, continue to monitor the person's blood pressure to look for signs of hypotension because once you relieve the problem that's causing the dysreflexia, then you're going to have a problem with the person's blood pressure bottoming, bottoming out if you put them on some type of antihypertensive agent prior to that. So keep constant monitoring on the blood pressure. Now, if a fecal impaction is suspected and if the blood pressure is less than 150 systolic, then you should check the rectum for stool and do it in the following manner. It's very much like catheterization. You're going to use a topical anesthetic once again to avoid any more noxious stimulation to the individual. Uh, so get some 2% lidocaine jelly, instill it into the rectum, and wait a couple of minutes before you start checking. Once, you, once a couple of minutes have passed, uh, using a gloved hand, obviously, uh, a lubricated finger again with the lidocaine jelly, check the rectum for stool, and if there is any, remove it. 
Now, oftentimes, the, the stimulus, regardless of the, of the uh, anesthetic jelly, will cause the person's uh, dysreflexia to increase. So if that does happen, what you want to do is stop and instill more of the topical anesthetic and give them about 20 minutes for it to take really good effect. All right, now, if, these, if this has not taken care of the problem, you need to start looking for the less frequent causes. At this point, you've taken care of loosening the clothing, you've checked the urinary bladder and all connective tubing, and you've checked the bowels. Um, at this point, you may want to consider hospitalizing the patient until you find out what the cause is. Now, this is the follow-up care. Anytime a person has an episode of dysreflexia, they need to be instructed to continue to monitor their symptoms for at least a couple of hours to make sure that it doesn't reoccur. And part of that training will also be to educate the individual to seek some medical attention should it recur. And if the person is an inpatient, then according to who his uh, primary health care team is, they should be monitoring him all the signs and symptoms for two hours as well. And once again, you would consider admitting an individual to the hospital primarily if the signs and symptoms of dysreflexia do not resolve. If you have not been able to find the problem or um, if they've just had a poor response to what you have done, they may want to, you may have to hospitalize them. And also, um, if you suspect there's any kind of obstetrical complication in a female with a spinal cord injury presenting with dysreflexia. Further items in the follow-up include documenting the episode of dysreflexia in the patient's medical record. That includes all the presenting signs and symptoms and what their course was throughout the episode, what the treatment was that you instituted with the individual, all the recordings of blood pressure readings and pulse. And I'd like to point out that the reason for taking them every three to five minutes is once you find the cause, it will take the body three to five to even ten minutes before the blood pressure goes back to its normal baseline. And another thing that you would want to include in the patient's records is, of course, his response to the treatment. You need to evaluate the effectiveness, of, the effectiveness of the treatment according to the outcome. The outcomes are the obvious, that the cause of dysreflexia has been identified and resolved, that the blood pressure has gone back to its baseline, and here I point out it's 90 to 110 systolic. It's not the 120 over 80 um, that traditionally would be a baseline. Another criteria is that the pulse rate has gone back to normal and that the individual is comfortable exhibiting no further signs of dysreflexia, including uh, the high blood pressure, intracranial pressure, or uh, risk of heart failure. And once the person has been stabilized, you want to review the entire cause of the dysreflexic episode with the individual, his friends, his family, significant others, anyone who brought, who brought him there or came with him so that they can be educated on it and understand why it happened and take care of it in the future in a preventative fashion, which is number 27. Give the individual a educational plan basically to prevent and to treat it in the emergency on their own. So basically, you would adjust their treatment plan so that they recognize those further episodes and that they can take care of them at home. And ideally, they would avoid them altogether. Um, in addition to that, you want the person to be able to uh, minimize the risks of getting that and to solve the problems when it comes up so they're not constantly calling 911 if their catheter is blocked or something like that, that they can understand exactly what's going on, take the steps to resolve it before it occurs so that they're, they reduce the incidence. And then if it does occur for whatever reason, they can uh, troubleshoot and find out what's going on and resolve it themselves as quickly as possible. And at the time of the patient's discharge, you want to give them as much information about autonomic dysreflexia as possible. That includes a consumer wallet card that's available through PVA. It has all the signs and symptoms listed on it. Um, and they come in both English and Spanish. The card looks like this, and it has all the signs and symptoms, and it even has the treatment program written on it. Um, if you ever have a patient with a spinal cord injury, you suspect autonomic dysreflexia, and they hand you this card, 
please look at it. I've had the unfortunate occurrence myself of having a, a dysreflexic episode, and I gave this to the EMTs, and they set it aside. I gave it to the ER physician, they set it aside. Um, spinal cord injured patients pretty much know their body and know what the problems are, so it's very important to listen to the patient. Um, but you do want to give the patient one of these cards. They're available through the PVA website. And then if you have a patient that has continuously reoccurring autonomic dysreflexia, you need to schedule some detailed medical exams to find out exactly what the underlying cause is. And this is important for the emergency room staff and for the EMTs. You can get the entire clinical guidelines and the consumer guide. They're available to download on the Paralyzed Veterans of America website. That website is www.pva.org. The particular documents that you will want to download are the ones that this presentation is taken from. That's the Professional Clinical Practice Guidelines, which is the acute management of autonomic dysreflexia, individuals with spinal cord injury presenting to healthcare facilities. The other document is the Autonomic Dysreflexia, What You Should Know. That's the consumer guide, and that's available both in English and Spanish. Print copies of these documents are available through the PVA Distribution Center. That's a toll-free number. It's 1-888-860-7244. And if you have further questions about this, there's a PVA Healthcare Hotline that you can also call toll-free. It's 1-800-232-1782. Again, this presentation has been produced by myself, Dr. Jerry Ryan, with the Oregon chapter of Paralyzed Veterans of America. Thank you.